So I have farmers that the, the, uh, their kids uh, are psychologists, are engineers. They looking for their own path. Mm. And many farmers are in the fourth generation of growing. So their grandparents and then and then and then and now younger generations see the price is not good. Um, uh, I want something new for my life. I want something innovative. They are not interested in growing the same way, following the same rules. And so they are doing their own lives because, you know, co for them, coffee is not interesting. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mappa Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode four of a fantastic series with Jonas Fijariso. And we are talking about Brazilian coffee in 2024. Uh, the last episode, we had a fantastic conversation about the geopolitics and how it's impacting coffee. In this episode, we want to talk about the incentives for the next generation of coffee producers and what incentives there are for small and medium holder producers to actually see through a succession plan for the next generation. Join us, help me understand the mindset of coffee producers. If we continue the uh, conversation from our last one about geopolitics, what is the landscape with regards to producers? Are they typically left-leaning? Are they typically right-leaning? Uh, are they um, are they old school? Are they technologists? Like w you are on the ground with producers all day, every day. So tell us what that looks like. Yeah, in Brazil, uh, most of the farmers, like mm -hmm. I said, is smaller or medium, mm -hmm. and uh, we have huge farms in the flat areas, uh, but most of them are more traditional in the way that they grow coffee. Mm -hmm. That means most of them have a more aligned idea of the conservative idea of stuff. Uh, this is because after the the sea market started, the things are not getting better. So mm -hmm. they saw something in the past that was better than today, uh, which they have no government support and for many things, and they prosper. But one of the reasons is because the sea price was more share mm. for that. So they could pay all their bills and labor was cheaper. And uh, another thing that they uh, some farmers think is about government assistance to people. Mm -hmm. uh, farmers uh, think many times that, sorry, they this assistance that I are making people do not work. You mean stimulus already, money? Yeah, they okay. already uh, receive money from the from the government, so it's easier to stay home instead of working. Uh, but the point for, in my opinion, the point is not related to receive money. It's related to, uh, sometimes better conditions of work or better salary or fair salary. Mm -hmm. uh, and the farmers, um, uh, think about, uh, okay, but I prosper without all this stimulus mm -hmm. and I get there and you should do the same. And so the gener in this point, the generation start to get conflicted, mm -hmm. uh, not only inside the farm, like family farms, uh, but um, uh, for the uh, workers, mm -hmm. the younger, that we know, uh, I know a lot of business grow, a lot of people prosper, 
in a harsh conditions. They work a lot, mm. uh, but people now are thinking more about them. And mm. this is good. So I have to get, have good quality with my family. I should travel. I should enjoy my time. Maybe I got tired of my work. So I, how can I say that? Um, it's not lost job. Like I said goodbye to my boss. I forgot uh, the word. You, you, you resign. Yeah. yeah. And I go to try a different yeah. uh, thing in my life. And uh, for a traditional People, no matter it's grower or not, it's not right that right. that is. They think, okay, we start this business. In in for me, the uh, one of the things that the new generation are not going to the coffee because many of them are trying to to try different things in their lives. Mm. Um, and so I have farmers that the the uh, their kids uh, are psychologists are engineers, they looking for their own path. Mm. And many farmers are in the fourth generation of growing. So their grandparents and then and then and then and now younger generations see the price is not good. Um, uh, I want something new for my life. I want something innovative. They are not interested in growing the same way, following the same rules. And so they are doing their own lives because, you know, for them, coffee is not interesting. It's really hard to um, convince a young um, um, man or woman that is more interesting to stay in the farm and work mm -hmm. or go outside the world and see different perspectives. And maybe I saw that in some um, situations that uh, uh, kids from the, the farmers go outside, have a profession, and then after 20 years, go back to the farm and start farming in a different way. I have mm. clients that uh, their father were a farmer 20 years ago, and then he worked. Uh, or she works uh, 20 years as an engineer or a doctor and they, they want to go back, but do different. Like wow. I'm a forest, regenerative, organic. And so it's interesting. This It's still very small, but mm -hmm. it's like 30% of my clients, it's like that. Wow. It's, they're interested to go back, but in a different way, with a different mindset about coffee growing. So they want to bring tourists, having uh, received them, Hotel. and have a good, yeah, things like that. So if I hear you correctly, the majority of smallholder and medium holder farms are mm -hmm. owned by people who are conservatives. For those who don't know what yeah. a conservative is, a conservative, conservatives believe in less government intervention in the way mm -hmm. that life is run. That's just to mm -hmm. put it very, very mm -hmm. basically, that's what that is. Um, and we live in an era where a lot of the people who are running farms, the information that was passed down to them from the generation that came before them is not the same kind of information that will be helpful to the next generation. Mm -hmm. of owners because of things like technology and because of things like climate change and energy transition, the way that coffee production is going to need to happen over the next 20 years is going to be very different than when the sea market first started and this current generation was becoming coffee producers. What, like what is Brazil looking at now when it looks at the future of coffee production, is it looking at the idea that, yes, these farms are going to be passed down or is it more a sense of consolidation is going to happen and big business is going to come in and buy those farms? Do it, is, is there a national conversation happening around that or is it just something that is being not talked about? Um. If you ask me that question about 10 years ago, 
I will say most of the coffee farming in the near future will be made by companies or people that are interested in grow coffee as a, a, a agribusiness, like yep. the farm is like industry, just yep. it's important to make farm. So I put money in there and I got farm, I got coffee in the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, but the things changed. One of the problems is related to climate <laughs> because many of these flat areas in Brazil mm -hmm. is, uh, is located in hot areas. So with the heat wave that we had in the last five months mm -hmm. affected a lot the yields for this year, 2024. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the areas were located there. So if you need, if you want to grow coffee in flat areas in Brazil, we need to, the farmer need more technology. It's more expensive. It's more complicated. So uh, today I do not know for sure because the mountainous area is more fresh here. It's turning to be an alternative again <laughs> to grow coffee in Brazil. And that is why I think the, the mechanized areas in Brazil do not expe expand, expanded mm -hmm. as, as far as we are taught 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I, wow. I will thought that everything will be me mechanized because of the costs related to, mm -hmm. to hand labor and it's harder to grow coffee in mountainous areas. But that not happens because it's not as easier as people think to grow coffee in flat areas. It's not so much cheaper because the climate conditions tend to be an issue there. So, okay, you could use irrigation, but first you need water to do the <laughs> irrigation. And there are some places that we had lack of rains and was in that area too, the flat areas, mechanized areas. Mm -hmm. So... It's it's hard to see the expansion of coffee there, and so uh, government are trying to give some kind of incentive to to uh, not just coffee but all the crops. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is not a specific, as far as I know, uh, for a different path in terms of government. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw like movements like. The one that grows a lot in the last two or three years, it's related to regenerative agriculture. Mm. And so we grow coffee and bring, uh, uh, it's not just about sustainable, in my opinion, because it's not, uh, it's not um, a main line to explain, uh, at least as far as I read. What is exactly regenerative agriculture? Okay. But the idea is, uh, is not just make sustainable, but do a little thing more. So in order to make the, the coffee Ecosystem. farm to bring some kind of benefits, like, mm -hmm. uh, do not. So I, instead of use a lot of fertilizer, the uh, usual one, the soluble one, I start, I start to use organic. Mm -hmm. Mix it in order to put more carbon into the, the ground, the oxide in the, into the ground. So I plant trees. Uh, so I use less pesticides and so on, so on. Mm -hmm. And so I saw, but it's more a movement of international buyers, uh, like in Germany mostly, mm -hmm. and that are interested in growing. That farmers have. Um, more sustainability instead of just following the rules of sustainability, but have a more uh, balanced uh, agroecological system to grow coffee or grow whatever kind of crop. Yeah, wow. It, it really is like a jigsaw puzzle that mm -hmm. you move one piece and you think that these two pieces fit together and then you realize that the jigsaw puzzle has four other sides mm -hmm. that also have to fit into a whole bunch of other things, right? Am I understand? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's far more complicated than a mm -hmm. lot of us think when we start to try to understand what the future is going to hold mm -hmm. for this, right? Yeah, it's, 
it's a kind of mix. I I, I really have um, for now. I have uh, um, a hard way to predict future because I still see people that want to pay less for their food or their coffee. There are people that are interested in very high standards of sustainability, which mm. sometimes is not sustainable too, because... <laughs> the irony. <laughs> yeah, because it, sometimes a farmer is, uh, put a lot of money there and they do not know exactly what they need to do. And the standards in each country is different. So uh, Germany wants something and China another thing and the United States another thing. So it's hard to the farmer follow mm. one of, uh, all the rules, like the new certification that you said. Mm. Um, in Brazil, it's not hard to do that because all the areas, I, I think 90, 90% of the areas in Brazil it's areas that the red had coffee for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So in Brazil, coffee is not something that put forests down to grow coffee. Uh, first, it's not just because we have the red settled areas. It's because the areas that we have forests, like in Amazon forest, mm -hmm. it's not as good for coffee too. Mm -hmm. and so it's in most on the southeast of Brazil. So... Uh, for Brazil, it's not complicated to follow that rules in order to export. Uh, for me, the only thing is how they going to um, certify that in each farm. Yeah. So who is going to certify that in well, each and, farm? And I would encourage yeah. folks to check out Inveritas mm -hmm. because I know that the folks at Inveritas, David Browning and his team, have been doing a great job. They're not a sponsor of this podcast. I don't get paid for saying anything <laughs> like that. Just want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, I just really like what Inveritas is doing around mm -hmm. that. But they are um, signing MOUs with governments around the world at the moment because their software that they have, uh, their imaging software, and David mm -hmm. has taken me through that. Um, mm -hmm. But they are using AI and images from satellites that are much, much more accurate than a lot of other people are using. So that's one alternative um, for mm -hmm. uh, that certification. And they're, they're signing um, MOUs, but also I know that they're working with the European Union to mm -hmm. understand what the requirements are. So that might be mm -hmm. a place to start. In the next episode, folks, we're going to be talking about the predictions that Jonas has for 2024 and 2025. And for those of you have, who have been waiting to hear about um, the heat uh, waves that have been happening, that's where we're going to start the conversation in the next episode. So join us for the final episode of this series. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.